morning boys and girls welcome 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 i am excited to see you i'm excited to hear about all that's been happening with you i've been getting some pictures i've been getting some videos i've seen that you are out and about and being safe but getting some sun and tan and boy has it been warm and nice outside welcome to another sunday for sunday school my name is karen and i'm one of the pastors at thompson pentecostal church we just call it short tpa here in thompson and i'm excited to have you if you're joining us for the first time welcome high five to you if you are new and joining us if you join me every week thumbs up i'm excited to have you one more sunday let's bow our heads lord we thank you for every boy and girl that is sitting here listening and are waiting to learn about you and to learn how much you love and care bless them wherever they are bless their families in jesus name amen amen haven't we just been having an awesome time i love sunday school time i love sundays because we get to be together and we get to sing and worship and we chat online and just have a great time so we've been covering um a series called campfire stories and we've been learning about how people have been trusting god right and this week we want to start off another series called hands on faith where we are going to be learning about how God wants us to get up and go out and do things for him and for those around us. So I'm excited about that new series that we're going to start and I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go on. We'll have a new memory verse because you learned the one from the last few weeks, right? So put that one in your pocket and we learn a different one. So I want us to go on over, get ready for our praise and worship song. Um, if you're sitting, jump up, right? If somebody's too close to you, get your own little space so you can dance because our song today says, I have decided to follow Jesus. Today is an important Sunday in church. It is Pentecost Sunday. That's right. It's Pentecost Sunday. And it's the day that we recognize when God came down as a spirit and fire and poured out himself upon his disciples and everybody else that was waiting on him. So we have to go over, sing our songs and um, just talk about how we want to follow Jesus. So let's do it. I've decided no turning back. Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. It gives me hope for each new. I'm gone 
no turning back. Eh? I've made up my mind that I'm gonna follow Jesus because guess what boys and girls we know that he would never lead us down any path that's not a good path right he would never ask us to follow him and then lead us in trouble that's not the kind of God that we serve and so when he calls us to follow him he wants us to do just that. Get up and follow him and do the things that he's asking us to do. So our lesson for today, our memory verse comes to us from the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews is a book that is in the New Testament, right? And it comes right um, before James. And so I want us to go to that book and we are going to be reading our scripture. Hebrew chapter 11 from verse 1, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, faith is being sure of what we hope for. It is being sure of what we do not see. Huh? So let's say it again. It's right here on the screen. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. And it is being sure of what we do not see. So even though we can't see it, we are believing and we are hoping that everything that God promises us, he will do. And the things that we ask of him, that is uh, good things, he's going to do it for us also. Okay, so that's our memory verse for today. And we are going to be going over to join Mrs. Chakri and Gospel Lamp. I wonder, um, did you think Gospel Lamp burnt his marshmallows last week? Did you see him trying to roast marshmallow? Um, I hope he got a good golden color on it. But we're going to go join them today for a Bible story. And our Bible story is talking about how Jesus called his first disciples, right? And so disciples were people who followed after Jesus. But he didn't um, just want everybody to follow him in the same capacity. He had those who were spe specially... Ah, close to him right and he called 12 disciples but he started off calling them twos and threes right until he got up to 12 so we are gonna learn about how jesus calls us to follow him right and that's our song i have made up my mind and i've decided that i'm gonna follow jesus so let's go over to mrs chakri and gospel lamb to learn about our bible story then we'll watch a cute video and come back to do a little bit more chatting about what we learned. See you soon. Gospel Lamb, what are you up to today? Well, Mrs. Chapri, I got all my friends here. I hear you're going to talk to the story about when Jesus went and looked for his disciples. So I thought I would look for my friends and, and get them all seated up so they can hear you tell the story today. Really? Wow, I'm going to have quite the crowd today when I tell the story. Well, I just thought it would be fun for them to hear because you're going to be teaching a lot about faith in the next few weeks. You know, faith and believing what Jesus said. And just think of the disciples. They had faith to believe that they could follow him and that he was someone special. So boys and girls, you're going to learn about that today too. So I'm going to get out of the way and let Mrs. Chuckery tell the story. Bye, and we'll see you next week. Good morning, boys and girls. It's time to get your Bible and I want you to make sure that when you get your Bible, you put it down carefully and you open it up and you put your bookmark on top of your Bible, just like this. And you need to get your parents to turn to page 308. Okay, boys and girls, today's story is Jesus chooses his disciples. And here you see Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee. Now let's see what the Bible has to say about this picture. Jesus began to tell people about God. He knew he had lots of work to do. So he went out to find some helpers. Okay, now let's look at this page. Okay, there's two men in a boat and they're fishing. Oh, look at all the fish they got in here. So let's see what the Bible has to say about this picture. 
As Jesus was walking along the seashore, he saw some fishermen. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me. I will make you fishers of people. Wow. Okay, let's turn the page. Remember, boys and girls, we turn our page carefully. <gasps> wow, look at this picture. This guy jumped out of the boat. And then there's two other fishermen over there. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this. Right away, they left their boats and followed Jesus. Their names was Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Okay, next page. Wow, this guy's different. He's not in a boat. Look at all the money falling off the table. Hmm, wonder what the Bible has to say about this. Later, Jesus met a tax collector named Matthew. Oh, so this must be Matthew. His job was to get the tax money from the people and give it to the king. Matthew quit his job to follow Jesus too. Oh, okay, let's turn the page. Okay, I'm just going to read what these next two pages say, and then I'm going to point out to you which disciples they are, okay? Jesus chose some more people. Their names were Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and another man named James. Thaddeus and Simon and Judas joined them too. Jesus now had 12 followers. He called them disciples. Jesus taught them about God's love. Okay, now let's take a look at all the different people that he called. Okay, here's Judas. There's Simon. Oh, and there's Thaddeus poking over the shoulder of Thomas. Ah, and then, of course, there's Jesus. James, son of Alphaeus, Bartholomew, Philip. Now we have to look at the other page. John. James, son of Zebedee, Peter, Matthew, and Andrew. Wow, that's lots of disciples. All right, boys and girls, the end of the story is here, so we're going to put our bookmark back in our Bibles. Carefully close your Bible. And remember, boys and girls, we need to put our Bibles in a safe place so it doesn't get wrecked. Bye, see you next week. Stories of the Bible. Jesus calls Peter. This is Jesus. Hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus grew up in Nazareth hey Jesus. and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. Jesus began teaching about God's love and healing people of their sickness. One day, John saw Jesus walking by and told the people around him that Jesus was the Lamb of God. One of the people standing with him was Andrew, whose brother was Simon, who would later be known as Peter. Andrew went to find his brother and said, We have found the Christ! Whoa! Ray? Come on! Simon went with Andrew and met Jesus. Uh-huh. I'm Simon. Jesus looked at Simon and said, Your name is Simon, son of John. Yes, it is. But you will be called Peter. Uh, okay. On another day, Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and lots of people crowded around him to hear what he had to say. Oh, uh, uh hello. Well, oh, okay. Jesus noticed two empty boats for Andrew and Peter had left them and were washing their nets. Jesus stepped into one of the boats hey, Peter. and asked Peter to take him out into the sea. Aye, aye. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Peter, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Uh... But Peter said, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. Whoa! They called to some other fishermen for help. Hey, help! And soon both boats were filled with fish. When Peter realized what happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. Jesus replied to Peter, Don't be afraid. Come, follow me, 
and I will show you how to fish for people. Really? Really? And as soon as they landed, they left their nets and followed Jesus. So Simon Peter became one of Jesus' 12 disciples and followed his friend Jesus throughout his time on earth. Welcome back, boys and girls. How awesome was that story from Mrs. Chakri and Gospel Lamb, right? And what's exciting about that is how God made provision for everything that we'll ever face, right? So here is Jesus who knows that he has this awesome story to tell. He has this word, right, about God's love for us and he wants to share it with people. Yes, there's a crowd around him, but what did he do? He wanted special people that he could pour into that would listen to him, that he could teach every single thing he wanted to. And so he called these four men, right? The four disciples that he called first, Andrew, James, John, right? Peter calling them um, to come and follow him. And so um, that's what happened. They came and followed him, gave up their life and what they were used to doing their fishing. And they came and said, we believe you and we want this. And so they were following him everywhere he was going. He was teaching them, preaching to them, right? Showing them all the miracles that he was capable of doing in people's lives. And as I look at this, I'm thinking, boys and girls, notice that he didn't go out and pick people who were at the top of the ladder. He didn't pick famous people, right? He selected simple, simple fishermen. And I love that because it tells me that in as much as we might not be famous, right? God is still calling you. He's still asking you to follow him. And as our song says, I've decided to follow Jesus. That's what he's doing. Listen, today is Pentecost Sunday. In churches all over the world, this day is celebrated because it is 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, right after he was crucified. And he told his disciples that I'm going to go but God, the Father, right, is going to send the Spirit to be with you so that you can have boldness, okay? And so, <clears throat> sorry, he, he left and the Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, which is God um, coming to live on our inside, they were in this room, all the disciples waiting on the promise of God and all of a sudden, it was just like fire and power just falling on them and they were baptized in the spirit so they got power and boldness to go share about what god can do and will do in the hearts of men you and i have heard about jesus because of these disciples they went all over the world and told this story about how he came he loved us, he died for us, and he's here to live in our hearts. They told that story. So I heard it, you heard it. I have the Lord in my heart. You can have him in your heart today if you invite him in. And so I'm, I'm so, so blessed when I hear these things of how God would choose simple people. So you have your neighbors, your friends, your family, right? That you can tell about the goodness and the love of God and what he's done because he's calling you and I to follow him. I'm excited to share more of, with, about this with you next week. Same time, same place. God bless you. Stay with us for announcement and our service today. We have a guest speaker, so you don't want to miss that. Boys and girls, see you next week. To do do.
Hi. Hey church family, we are the Winchips and we just wanted to say we hope you're all doing well. We miss you and we look forward to when we can all be together again. We know these times can be tough on families in so many ways, so please know we're praying for you. We can worship anywhere because God is everywhere, but we sure do miss our role being filled with these children and extra children <laughs> and the room being filled with more voices than just ours on a Sunday morning. So until we meet again, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor. And give you his peace. Number 6, verses 24 to 26. We love you!
Good morning, church. I'm so glad that we can get together once again um, just to meet. I hope that you're all doing well. I am doing okay. This last while I have really been reassured of what a great, big, wonderful God I serve. Our scripture tells me that he loves to look after his children. And I think in these days with so much uncertainty in it, we all need that reassuring that God is looking after his children. Uh, I have really been claiming Psalms uh, 91, and I'd love to read that to you. It's Psalms 91, verses 1 and 2. It says, Those who live abide constantly, not just an occasional visit, but those who are constantly abiding in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare of the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I am trusting in Him. I have just really been meditating on this and claiming it, and He's become my solid rock. And as I just keep on uh, claiming these promises, I have such a deep peace, and I'm so thankful for that. And the exciting thing is that these verses are not only promises for me, but they are promises for every single individual that has ever asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord and the Savior. He can give you that same peace. Now, after sharing that with you, let's just go into prayer and pray for the service. Father God, I just thank you for the opportunity that we can once again hear your word. We invite the Holy Spirit to come. And as he, as he opens up our hearts to be able to receive, we ask you, Lord, that you will take that anointed word and that as it goes into our hearts, that you will teach us, Father, how to learn to walk in those spiritual truths. Father, I thank you for every single individual that is listening today. Father, we all have needs, and I just pray that, Almighty God, that you will undertake in whatever need it is. You see all, you hear all, and you know all. And because you are Almighty God, there is nothing that is too difficult for you to answer. Father, we, we thank you in advance. Our hearts are grateful for what you are doing and how you are answering these prayers. And we thank you because you love us and you are concerned over them. I also pray, Father, that you will continue to keep your hand of protection upon each individual. I pray that you will keep them safe. And I pray that you will teach us to keep our eyes focused upon you, Lord, because you truly are our solid rock. And in these times, Father, again, we thank you that you love us, 
that you care for us. You only have the best interests in, in heart for us. And so, Jesus, help us to keep focused on you. Lord, I thank you for this day, and we all pray this in Jesus' name now. Amen. Blessings upon you all. Continue to take care and be safe. And good morning. It is uh, Communion Sunday. Um, I hope you were uh, prepared for this today. Um, we tried to let people know that uh, today would be uh, Communion. If you aren't ready, well, you have a quick second to run and uh, grab some, some items that will uh, let you participate in Communion with us. Uh, any kind of a, 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 a juice or a beverage and a piece of bread or a cracker, um, whatever you've got at home, uh, will work just fine. Um, I want you to know that uh, you do not have to be uh, a member of Thompson Pentecostal Assembly to participate in communion. Um, the criteria are that you are a, a follower of Christ, you've surrendered your life to Jesus, and you are uh, living life God's way instead of your own way. Um, you don't have to be perfect to uh, participate in communion. Um, but if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, then uh, this part of the service is really meaningless for you. Um, this is something that Jesus asked his followers to do um, uh, until he returned. Um, he asked us to remember his death um, and resurrection. He asked us not to forget the sacrifice that he made. So communion is a time of remembrance. Um, it is a sacred time when we stop and we pause uh, and we focus on the singularity of the cross and how nothing else could um, fulfill the need uh, that we had for uh, something to deal with our sin problem. Uh, and so Jesus says, remember what I did for you. And so we try and do that on a monthly basis together where we uh, stop and pause and um, remember what Jesus did. And so the, uh, the, the items that we use, we have something that's a, uh, a small piece of bread uh, or a cracker. Um, that represents Jesus' broken body um, that, was, uh, that was bruised for, for us. And we also have a, a, a little bit of juice of some kind uh, that represents Jesus' shed blood. Um, and this is what the scriptures say about um, this sacred time. It says this. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting to read at verse 23, it says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. So let's take a minute right now and and hold on to our bread, and uh, we'll eat it together in a minute. Um, but the, the scripture says that we should examine ourselves. Um, we should take a look inside and, and uh, ensure that, uh, that our hearts are in the right place, that we have the right attitude towards uh, this uh, part of uh, our relationship with Jesus. Um, the warning here is not to is not to take part in communion without considering what took place, considering the cost that was paid for you and I, considering the high price that was paid by Jesus to uh, see that your sins would be forgiven and that your uh, body could be healed. So this morning. Before we eat of that bread, let's just take a moment to, uh, to give God time and space. Let's examine ourselves. I'm just going to be quiet for just a few seconds for, for you just to contemplate. Where is your heart at today? Have you, have you paid attention to the price that was paid for your salvation? Let's do that for a moment together.
Jesus, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you for going to that cross for us. We thank you for taking the punishment and the shame upon yourself for the things that you hadn't done wrong, but the things that we would do wrong. God, we don't take lightly this piece of bread that represents your broken body. We know you suffered for our behalf, and we thank you for that today. Let's eat the bread together. Then we have the cup, and the cup represents Jesus' shed blood, and we know that Scripture says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And we know that word remission, we hear that a lot in, in, in cancer patients when the cancer is gone. They say it's gone into remission. Well, our sin is something that we were born with and afflicted with. And until Jesus shed blood is applied to our lives, our sin is running rampant in our lives and it's going to kill us. But scripture says because of what Jesus did on the cross, our sin has gone into remission. It no longer has power over us and no longer will lead to eternal death. So let's drink of the cup together and thank Jesus for his shed blood. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross that has made a way for our sins to be forgiven. We thank you, Father God, for sending your one and only Son to be the only sacrifice, the only acceptable sacrifice that could cover our sin debt. And Jesus, we acknowledge you today that you were the one who went to the cross for our sin on our behalf for our salvation and our redemption. And we thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. In his name we ask all these things. And everybody said, amen. All right, thanks. Let's continue on with the service this morning. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, so glad that you could be with us today. And thank you, everyone, for uh, all your hard work in making this service possible again today. Um, the Winships for the greeting and uh, Donna for uh, the prayer and of course the worship team for um, all the work that they've done and put into this service. So thank you so much for that. Just want to give you a couple of quick announcements. Next Sunday, um, that is June the 7th, uh, we'll be wrapping up our series on spiritual gifts um, in the morning. And then next Sunday evening at six o'clock, we are going to have a special Zoom meeting, um, uh, and we are going to go through a spiritual gift analysis. Um, and if you've been following along with uh, with us in our spiritual gift gift series, um, you know we've been talking a lot about how God has designed and shaped us, and we want to end the series by um, giving you a good idea of how God has designed you with your spiritual gifts. Um, so we're going to get together from about six to seven p.m. next week Sunday on Zoom. Um, if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, we need you to register. And you can register by going to our website, uh, thompsonchurch.ca. Click on the uh, Connection Groups tab. Uh, choose Spiritual Gifts and then register that way. Or, or you can text the word GROUPS to 204-677-3435. Um, follow the link that we send you and you can register that way. Once you're registered, we will send everybody a link to the Zoom meeting. Um, where you can sign on and join us together. Um, as well, we'll send you a link where you can go to the PDF and uh, download and print um, a hard copy that you're going to need to do the spiritual gifts analysis. Now, if you lack a printer at home, uh, you can contact the church office and Karen can print you off a copy and arrange a time for you to come and pick one up here before uh, next week Sunday. So, uh, and if you have, to, if you have trouble um, uh, with Zoom, you don't understand how that works, you can give us a call here at the office and we'll do our best to uh, to get you started. Um, you just need a, uh, a mobile phone with a data plan um, or Wi-Fi or a, a computer of some kind with a web camera and you can join us on Zoom. So I also want to take the time this morning to update you on where we are uh, in the process of returning to in-person ministry. Um, I've heard from, uh, from several people that, uh, that are eagerly anticipating uh, the return uh, to live church. Um, 
and I have to have to be honest. I, I'm I'm missing um, you people here uh, at TPA. Um, now I'm I'm enjoying our connection times online and the fact that we're able to have so many more and new people join us online. Um, that's been a wonderful thing. But I miss the personal connection that comes with in-person uh, church. Uh, and over the last week or two, we've heard lots of announcements from. Uh, the province of Manitoba um, that uh, is is leading to the relaxing of some uh, restrictions. Uh, and this has led to some increased anticipation um, of churches like ours returning to live worship services. I want to let you know that the board and staff ha have been praying and asking God for wisdom in how we should proceed. Uh, there have been lots of discussions at the leadership level regarding if and when we'll be uh, opening up again. And, and to help us understand what we should be looking at when it comes to reopening, we've developed a, a quick survey that we need your help with. Um, and we need as many of you as possible to participate in that survey. Um, there's a link in the description of today's feed, either on YouTube or Facebook. Um, if you haven't already done so, after the service, could you please go to that link, click on that link and fill out that quick survey for us. It'll take you two to five minutes tops um, to do that. You can fill it out with your name or you can fill it out anonymously, uh, whatever you prefer. It's all secure. Um, uh, we're not going to share that information with anybody else. It's just for our uh, church leaders to uh, get an idea of where people's hearts and minds at. Uh, are at with, uh, with regards to returning to in-person ministry. Uh, and it is important to us for us to get the best results for you to answer all the questions. So um, that would be very helpful for us as well. Uh, so far, about 90 people have started the survey, um, but uh, only about two thirds of those have actually finished the entire thing. And I know that some of you are eager to get back into the building and as leaders, so are we. Uh, however, I need to be honest and uh, uh, that we need a great deal of wisdom and understanding to do that as safely as possible. Uh, as leaders, we wanted to let you know where we are uh, when it comes to when and if we'll reopen. So here's some quick things that you need to know about where your leaders are right now in their hearts and their minds. First of all, we know that this is difficult for everyone, and, and for some, it's, it's even increasingly difficult than, than the average. But we want to know that we will get through this. God has promised us that. 2 Corinthians 4, 7-9 says, We know we have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. Amen? We are pressed in every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. So yes, these times are tough. Some of us are struggling more than others, but we will get through this because God promises that even though we're pressed on every side, we will not be destroyed. Secondly, I want to point out to you that your leaders recognize that being permitted to open does not mean that we should open. Paul said this, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. So as we proceed, we need to have a plan to reopen that is safe, that makes sense and continues to put our own wants and needs secondary to those of our brothers and sisters in Christ and of our community. So being able to open is not the same as being smart and wise about reopening. Thirdly, we recognize that these are challenging times, but with that comes opportunities to share Jesus. COVID-19 has given our church the opportunity to share Jesus in a way that we never have before. We can focus on the troubles that COVID brings, or we can look and see what great opportunities God is giving us to be his church. The leadership chooses to focus on the opportunities, the way forward, the positive things that God has for us during this. 
Fourthly, our leaders are ready to try things if it means reaching our community. They say crisis is an accelerator. It speeds up what is eventually going to happen anyway. And our leaders have been good at uh, considering new opportunities, but this crisis has accelerated that. And our leaders are considering some new opportunities that will have an impact for the kingdom here in Thompson. Now, we don't guarantee that they're all going to work. We don't guarantee that they're all going to be successful. But I can guarantee you that our leaders are going to try, that we're going to get our church to try new things and new opportunities. And lastly, our leaders are choosing to focus on what we do have and not what we don't have. Is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Well, neither. For us, we are blessed and fortunate here in Canada that we actually have a glass. Pastor Abby said in his Fresh Bread this uh, post this last week that we have so much to be thankful for. We may not have everything we want, we most cert but we most certainly have everything we need. God is blessing and anointing so many things that we put our hands to our TPA. Breakfast in a bag. Our prayer ministry is growing. Our small groups have been thriving. And people have surrendered their lives to Jesus, all in the midst of a pandemic. Let me finish off this, this portion of the service by saying how grateful I am to our staff and board for their dedication and support. None of us have been trained to handle anything like this. Uh, we are leaning very much on God for his support and his wisdom and his care and his concern and his provision. Uh, we are hearing him speak through his word and by the power of his spirit. And we're even hearing God speak through one another. I want to say thank you to our leaders for all their time and all their energy and all their support. TPA, please know that your leaders are working hard to make the greatest impact we can for the kingdom here in Thompson. We want to do that safely. We want to do that in wisdom, and we want to do that in Holy Spirit power. Thanks again for listening. God bless you. Now it's time for our message today from Pastor Jeff Feuders. Enjoy. Well, it's a privilege for me to be able to be speaking to your church today on this Pentecost Sunday. And I want to say thank you to your pastor for the opportunity and also to you for allowing me into your living room or maybe to your car if you're at a drive-in service today, wherever you are watching from. Uh, just briefly, let me tell you that we have a ministry that helps other uh, Christian and Messianic ministries in Israel. And also we fund a number of special projects and humanitarian aid uh, projects there as well. You can find out about us on our website, firstcenturyfoundations.com, uh, and you can also follow us on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about the person in the Godhead that we know as the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we believe in the Trinity, that God is three distinct personalities in one, God the Father, uh, God the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit three in one. And so today, maybe you're not a Christian, you're watching, and you're wondering, what does this have to do with me? Well, even if you don't believe in God, maybe you've wondered about God at some point, I want you to know that it is the Holy Spirit who the Bible tells us is the one who draws us to God and who reveals the truth about God to us. So hang in there. Maybe a light will come on for you today. Maybe you're someone who says, well, I'm spiritual. I'm not really religious. Well, just know this. There are really only two kinds of spirits that influence us, evil spirits and the Holy Spirit. And so it's possible you might just want to learn a little bit and know more about the Holy Spirit today. Well, today is what we call Pentecost Sunday. And as Pentecostals, this day is significant for us. But what if I told you the significance is much greater than what many of us have understood regarding the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on those gathered there? This is some of what we want to look at this morning. And so I'd ask you, wherever you are, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to begin to read at verse 1 and just read about four verses today. 
But here's what it says in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came. Now, just stop there for a moment. Let's stop for a moment. Why did this day already have a name if the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out. We associate Pentecost with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the day of Pentecost with the same. But but here is some history that some of you may know, but maybe some of you don't. Uh, You see very quickly, in the Old Testament, God had given the children of Israel instructions about a number of feasts that they were to observe. Four in the spring, three in the fall. And we don't have time to talk about all of those today, but suffice it to say this, they are all extremely important occasions that not only mark a significant event or symbolize a posture of the heart and recognition of God's hand at work through the Jewish people, but they also point to a future day of fulfillment through the Messiah. Many of them have an agricultural basis based on times of harvest. And so the first three spring feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, had all been fulfilled with the coming of Jesus or the coming of Yeshua and his death and burial and resurrection. That's another teaching for another time. The fourth spring feast is called by the Hebrew name Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks. And this was another harvest feast uh, around the barley harvest, and it involved counting off seven weeks plus a day or 50 days from the first day after the Sabbath following the Passover. And the Greek name for Shavuot was Pentecost, which literally means 50. So picture this. The disciples had gone back to Jerusalem after Jesus had ascended from the Mount of Olives into heaven back to the upper room where they began to follow Jesus' instruction to wait. And while they waited, the text says that they joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Jesus appeared to his disciples, remember, for 40 days after his resurrection, leaving 10 more days until the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost would come. And during these 10 days, the disciples and others waited. They waited. Now, I was wondering, what were they doing while they waited? What did they talk about? I know, of course, that they prayed, but did they also perhaps discuss the things that Jesus had taught them? Were they pondering what their next steps should be or would be? Were all of the lights beginning to come on now and the truths that Jesus had shared with them now becoming clear? Well, I'm not sure that everything was becoming crystal clear, but I think that it's important for us to note that they did have some key pieces to the puzzle. They knew the mission, go into all the world. And they knew the message, the gospel, or the good news that God is salvation, that Jesus saves. And they knew the strategy. They knew the method. They were to preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything that Jesus had taught them. But there was one more piece that eluded them. Something was missing, something that they hadn't really been given yet. And that is why Jesus said to them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, the gift of the promised Holy Spirit. So let's go back to the text for just a moment. Acts 2 again, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place and suddenly A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So remember, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, Luke wasn't referring to the event of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because it hadn't happened yet. But he was referring to the Jewish feast that the disciples and all of the other Jewish followers of Jesus would be observing and celebrating, along with Jews from all over the world. And that's why they were all together. 
they were, uh, they were celebrating Shavuot or Pentecost in the upper room, just as they had celebrated Passover there with Jesus a few weeks before. And this is important. Jesus had told them to wait for the person of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, they had also been waiting for a day to arrive. They were doing something called counting the Omer, which is a a measurement of grain or barley, until Pentecost came. There was some significance to this idea of counting. It indicated suspense that was building. Something was coming, and each day they would recite a prayer and say a blessing. You see, something very significant happened at the giving of the law or the Ten Commandments or the Torah. And this was the event that Shavuot commemorates. The Israelites were given in that moment the very words of God. They heard the voice of God. And so each time they counted the Omer as they were counting down in hope and anticipation that something very significant would happen again just like it had on the day the law was given. How interesting that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened on the exact same day as this observance of the feast of Shavuot. Why is it interesting? Well, quickly, here's a few more details about about the feast. As we've noted, Shavuot commemorated the giving of the law or the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Here's another little interesting fact. Tradition says that it took the children of Israel 50 days to reach Sinai after the Exodus, after the first Passover. Another fact, on the day the law was given in Exodus chapter 19 and 20, a few very significant things happened. Uh, A trumpet was sounded that grew louder and louder. Uh, The mountain was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Smoke billowed, the Bible says, and the mountain literally trembled. And then it says, God answered by a voice in Exodus 19, verse 19. And again, in 20, verse 18, it says that when the people saw the thunder, the King James Version there says the word thunderings, there is a hint here that they could actually see the voice of God speaking, that they could see the sound waves emanating from the mountain. From rabbinic tradition, a Jewish commentary called the Midrash, in a book called Rabbah 5 and verse 9, it says, when God gave the Torah on Sinai, he displayed untold marvels to Israel with his voice. He spoke and the voice reverberated throughout the whole world. It says there also that all the people witnessed the thunderings. That means they, they saw them with their eyes. Uh, World-famous Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, also in the Midrash, says, God's voice as it was uttered, remember he's talking about the, the law being given on Sinai, God's voice as it was uttered split up into 70 voices in 70 languages so that all the nations should understand. Wow. And here's one more quote from the Midrash about the giving of the law. Uh, from a book called Shemot Rabbah, which means Great Exodus, says the children of Israel not only heard the Lord's voice, but actually saw the sound waves as they emerged from the Lord's mouth. They visualized them, get this, they visualized them as fiery substance. Now on that day that the law was given, what else happened? Do you remember? Well, there was rebellion. The children of Israel came to Aaron when Moses was on the mountain and asked him to make them a golden calf. And they began to to revel and worship this calf. And because of the sin of idolatry that day in Exodus 32, the judgment of God was that about 3,000 people died. 3,000 people. Now, think about this. Here are the elements uh, that we glean from that information about Shavuot, about the first giving of the law. There was wind, uh, there was fire present, there was loud noise, the trumpet that got louder and louder, there were different languages, and this number, 3,000 people. Now, does any of that remind you of anything? See, what was happening on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, God was fulfilling the feast of Shavuot with the coming of the Holy Spirit that Jesus, that Yeshua, had promised. Now, instead of only the letter of the law that brings death, 
Romans 7 and verse 5, this would be further enhanced by the Spirit who brings life, according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. And the signs of fulfillment are all here. A rushing mighty wind that filled the whole house. What seemed to be tongues of fire that settled over every person. And then they began to speak in other tongues, which in this case turned out to be understandable languages. And the living word was preached on this day. The law was given on Mount Sinai. Today, the living word of God, the truth about Jesus, the Logos was preached. And here's the other thing, 3,000 people received eternal life, came to know Yeshua, Jesus, as their Messiah on that day. Now, that's just incredibly coincidental, or it is the actual fulfillment of the Feast of Shavuot that was happening. So there's your background information. Now quickly, let's look at what does this mean for us today and answer a few key questions, okay? First of all, this thought, the Holy Spirit with us, the Holy Spirit with us, that means he's accessible now. And here's the question, who has access? Well, what happened on the day of Pentecost was a, a watershed event in the history of the world because what happened in the upper room in Jerusalem to those 120 people gathered there waiting for the promised Holy Spirit was something that had never happened before. You see, before in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was referenced at creation, and then after that would only rest on certain individuals at certain times for very specific tasks. Exodus 31, verses 2 and 3, God says, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill ability and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. This was for the preparation for the building of the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. The Holy Spirit also came upon people in the Old Testament who filled a certain office or task, namely prophets, priests, and kings. Numbers 11 and 25 says, Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke with him, with Moses. And he took of the spirit that was on Moses, and he put the spirit on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. Then when Samuel anointed Israel's first king, King Saul, he told him a number of things, including what we read in 1 Samuel 10 and verse 6. He said, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power and you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into a different person. But in the Old Testament, if you weren't a prophet or a priest or a king or uh, you hadn't been specifically selected by God for a specific task, the Holy Spirit was not accessible to you. And that's why the day of Pentecost was so significant, because that day signaled the beginning of the Holy Spirit being poured out on everyone. All who were in the upper room were filled. Peter would later say that Joel's prophecy that stated that God in the last days would pour out his spirit on all people was being fulfilled on this very day. In verse 4 of Acts 2, it says, all of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. But even more than that was happening. Yes, the Holy Spirit was poured out for everyone and became accessible in that very general sense, but the Holy Spirit was also being given to individuals in a very personal way. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit then uh, doesn't just mean the Holy Spirit uh, with us, it means the Holy Spirit in me. It's a personal experience. And, and again, we ask the question, well, how do we experience this? In Acts 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now think about all who were in the room that day. The disciples, of course, but the text tells us that there were many more followers of Jesus in the room, about 120 according to uh, verse 15 of Acts chapter 1. And these tongues of fire, it says, settled on each of them. There was one for each of them individually. And it also says that everyone present was filled with 
the Holy Spirit. Not just the special people, uh, not just the disciples, or even just the ones who had been following Jesus for a certain or specific length of time, but each of them, everyone present, was filled. The mother and brothers of Jesus were filled, along with others, including other women, it says in Acts 1 and 14. And likely these were some, if not all of the women mentioned in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, who had been delivered from evil spirits by Jesus. Now they're receiving the Holy Spirit. Also of note would be Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, who very likely could have been present. And I mentioned the women in particular for this reason, because women in those days were looked on as as chattel, as property, uh, more the level of a servant or a slave. And the Holy Spirit was poured out on them just like everyone else. Everyone individually was included. And the pouring out of the Spirit had its impact on them. They, they all spoke in other uh, languages, in another tongue as the Spirit enabled them. Now remember, the speaking in tongues was not the gift. In this case, it was only the sign or the evidence of a greater gift, a total transformation that was taking place inside of them. Uh, this timid group who were waiting in the upper room wondering, what now? were now suddenly causing quite a stir. And there were those who were there staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from all over the world, and they were amazed and perplexed, the Bible says, that these Jesus followers were speaking to them in their own language the wonderful works of God. For a great example of this personal transformation of the Holy Spirit in a life, we need to look no farther than Peter. Remember Peter? compulsive Peter, you know, jump out of the boat, Peter. Peter, who had moments of great spiritual insight, like, uh, you know, when he said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, who also lobbed off the high priest servant's ear in a misguided attempt to protect Jesus. Peter, who also, also bragged openly that he would die with Jesus and never deny him. And then the very next day swore up and down that he didn't know him. Yeah, that Peter. Now remember that Luke is writing to Theophilus this second letter, a follow-up to the book of Luke. And the last time Luke mentioned Peter was immediately after he had denied Jesus. And so in Luke's writing, the contrast is dramatic. Peter before was often compulsive, misguided, and erratic, although for the most part well-intentioned. And after his three denials of Jesus, his eyes had locked with the eyes of Jesus in an overwhelming moment of realization. And Peter had gone out and wept bitterly. That was the end of the book of Luke. Now, the beginning of Acts, we come to Luke's next mention of Peter in Acts 2, and he is almost unrecognizable. Before, Peter had been bullied by a servant girl and a couple other bystanders into a complete denial of, of Jesus Christ. And now, look at verse 14 of Acts 2. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, and he raised his voice and then addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. See, this was nothing short of a total transformation in the life of Peter. The Holy Spirit in him had made a remarkable difference. Suddenly he was bold and confident. Suddenly he stepped forward and took charge. Suddenly he had authority and he had something meaningful to say. Well, this is what it means to be included in the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to have the Holy Spirit in me. You see, without the Holy Spirit, Peter was just a man who's doing his best, struggling along to be the kind of person that Jesus wanted him to be, much like we do. And that was fine and everything, but, but he struggled in his own strength. And he was timid and he drew back from the challenge. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter was transformed from coward to courageous. And he stood unapologetically with great confidence in front of thousands that day to speak. And it was the power of the Holy Spirit in him that made the difference. Later, the great apostle Paul talked about the power of the Spirit and the difference that it made in his preaching. He said in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 4, and my message and my preaching were very plain, 
Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives, to make us bold, to make us courageous, to make us confident as we share with others the truth about Jesus and we live the Spirit-filled life before them. He wants to do that, but he wants to do so much more than that as well. And that brings me to this last thought, and that is the Holy Spirit through us, the Holy Spirit working through us. And the question is, why is this experience important to you and me? Well, Acts 2, 14 to 16 says, you know, Peter is speaking. He says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this was what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Peter not only addresses the crowd with newfound confidence because of the transforming work of the Spirit in him, He also now suddenly has incredible clarity and insight because of the Holy Spirit working and speaking through him. You see, earlier that day, Peter had no idea what exactly was going to happen. And so for him now to know suddenly that this was what was spoken of by the prophet Joel, he didn't figure that out by himself. Again, this was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Peter went from being almost clueless about what was going to happen next to complete comprehension of what had just taken place. And it was the Holy Spirit who gave Peter that understanding now about what the prophet had spoken. He preached a very pointed message about Jesus who they had crucified, but who now was resurrected and exalted to God's right hand. And the people, it says, were were cut to the heart. The Holy Spirit was not only empowering and enabling Peter in that moment, he was also convicting the people who were listening. Peter didn't have all of this knowledge on his own, but the Holy Spirit working through him helped him to understand what was happening in light of Scripture and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter was not only able then to put it all together, but was able to clearly articulate it to the crowd that was listening. You see, because the Holy Spirit helps us to understand God's Word and speaks to us through God's Word as well, He also then brings to our remembrance, the Bible says, things that we have read in the Bible before that pertain maybe to a current circumstance or situation. The Holy Spirit illuminates or or brings light to the Word of God and, and makes it alive in our hearts and minds. It makes the Bible come alive to us. And I wonder if Peter was now not only remembering, but also relying on Jesus' words from John 14 and verse 26, when Jesus said, however, the the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything, and he will remind you of everything that I have ever told you. So not only does the Holy Spirit help us to understand God's Word and its significance in light of the events in our lives, but the Holy Spirit actually literally gives us words to say. Peter didn't just understand the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in light of prophecy all of a sudden, but I believe the Holy Spirit also gave him the words to say as he addressed the crowd that day. So the Holy Spirit working through us takes our inability and our insecurities and replaces them with with insight and inspiration and authority. He gives us words to say like he did with Peter. And so just quickly to recap today, the Holy Spirit with us, the power of the Holy Spirit is no longer only for special people. Now it is for everyone who will receive. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God will call, the Bible says. And then the Holy Spirit in me, he wants you to experience him personally. And so just surrender, be open, just receive the Holy Spirit into your life. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit through us. This is not just some experience for experience sake. The Holy Spirit is given so that he can work through us, so that he can give us boldness to share about Jesus and to be his witnesses. 
The day of Pentecost in Acts 2 was the fulfillment of the Jewish feast of Shavuot, the fulfillment of the giving of the word of God or the Torah, which was the letter of the law. And now it's culminating in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit who makes the word alive, who convicts of sin and who reveals Jesus to us and gives, uh, teaches us and gives us words to say and gives us power to be his witnesses, who literally brings the word to life. The law of the Spirit who gives life, it says in Romans 8 and verse 2, has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so if you're not a believer in Jesus today, I believe the Holy Spirit is is drawing you to him. And the Holy Spirit is, is revealing Jesus to you. And that feeling that you're feeling is, is the Holy Spirit convicting you in your heart. And all you need to do to receive Jesus today is to simply pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me and you gave your life so that I could be free and have forgiveness of my sin. I believe you rose again to conquer death and hell. Jesus, forgive me of my sins, the wrong things that I have done, and make me a new person in you. Help me to live the way I ought to live so that you are pleased with me in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you prayed that simple prayer with me today, make a comment in the comment section and someone will follow up with you. Or in a moment, listen for your pastor's instructions when they return to the screen. I know someone's going to want to reach out to you and help you with that decision that you have made. If you're already a believer in Jesus, but you're not sure that you've had this, you know, Holy Spirit experience, just receive it today. Just be open. Pray and ask for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You don't need to be in a room full of people to receive. The Holy Spirit will meet you where you are. You just need to desire and to seek for that experience with him and invite him to come and fill you. And I believe that he can do that right where you are sitting right at this moment, wherever you are in Canada today. You know, I heard a story recently, a pastor friend mentioned that after a Zoom Bible study and prayer meeting that they had had together with a group, uh, one of the participants in the meeting was home afterwards praying for their Muslim neighbors and began to speak in a language they didn't understand as they were praying. They were just so moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they reached out to the pastor after and said, this is what happened. Uh, does this mean something? Is, you know, is there anything going on here? And the pastor was able to explain, this is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And so it can happen to you wherever you are. Another story I remember was of a husband and wife. He was a police officer. She was a nurse. They both worked shift work. And together they had been learning about the Holy Spirit and they were seeking this experience in their lives. And one night uh, after many times praying together, many times going to the altar at their church when, uh, you know, that was still allowed, uh, they, they were apart. He was working a night shift. And so in his cruiser at the end of his shift, early in the morning, he was praying and the Holy Spirit fell in that car, in that cruiser and filled him with his power. He began to speak in tongues and, and was just amazed at what was happening. He went home and he told his wife and she asked him, you know, what time did that happen? Because as they found out after, right, right around that very same time, she was sitting at the kitchen table having her morning coffee and devotions and the Holy Spirit came to her in the very same way. And so they experienced this wonderful experience apart, but together at the very same time. Isn't that amazing? Folks, the Holy Spirit wants to give you his power. God wants you to have this experience. And so I invite you to just invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for the Holy Spirit who teaches us and who leads us, who guides us and reveals truth to us. And thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives us power, empowers us, and makes the word of God come alive to us and makes us bold witnesses today. And Lord, I pray wherever folk are watching from British Columbia all the way across to Newfoundland this morning, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would minister to those who are reaching out to you right now. And Lord, give them the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would receive the Holy Spirit in this moment. 
Father, we pray for those who may have made a decision today to follow Jesus for the very first time. Have your hand upon their lives. And Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son to die for us. You sent your son so that we could be part of your family and you gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could be his witnesses. Father, we give you praise today and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello everyone, welcome. Um, this is my very first pandemic baby dedication. It's also my very first twin baby dedication. So this is a, a, a day of first. Uh, Pastor Karen and I are pleased to be here with Jermaine and uh, Kisia Koch. Uh, and they brought their twins, Navarro and Navicia, uh, here today to dedicate their precious children to God. And children are something we recognize as a blessing. Psalm 127.3 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. And what this family is choosing to do today before God in their church is something that we see done in Scripture many times. Uh, in 1 Samuel, Hannah presents her son Samuel to the Lord. And then in Luke chapter 2, we see Mary and Joseph doing the same thing with their boy Jesus. And recognizing that this is an important principle, these parents, Jermaine and Cassia, have gone before the Lord, come before the Lord in their church family to dedicate their children, Navarro and Navicia, back to their Heavenly Father. Amen. These parents have freely chosen to dedicate their children back to the Lord today. Recognizing that the uh, responsibility for their children's spiritual care is important, just as their physical and emotional care is important. And we know that parents are the primary caregivers for their children. So God has trusted Navicia and Navarro to your care, Casey and yes. Jermaine. Thank you. And the responsibility for teaching your children who God is and the sacrifice that Jesus has made for them is distinctly a role that Scripture gives to you parents. It says, listen, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with all your mind, with your whole being, and all your strength. These words I am commanding you today must be kept in mind. And you must teach them to your children and speak of them as you sit in your house, as you walk along the road, and as you lie down, and as you get up. Recognizing these truths, I ask now that you enter into the following commitment in the presence of God and his people. So that Navarro and Navicia may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you, their parents, vow by God's help and in partnership with the church to provide your children a Christian home of love and peace, to raise them in the truth of the Lord's instruction and discipline, and to encourage them to one day trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you do say, we do. We do. Now, the blessing of being part of a community like the church is the responsibility of raising our children can be shared. The popular proverb says it takes a village to raise a child. And while we acknowledge that parents are the primary caregivers of their children, the example in Scripture is the church being a body speaks of a shared responsibility. The church, the body of Christ, can and should participate in assisting these parents in raising their child to serve God which is where you, the church, come in. Having come freely, I ask now that you make the following commitment to those who stand before you, so that Navarro and Navicia may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you, as the church, vow by God's help to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ, to help Jermaine and Cassia to be faithful to God, and to help teach and train these two children in the ways of the Lord, so that they might one day trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. If you accept that responsibility, please respond by saying, we do. We do. We do. All right. I'm going to take one of these precious babies, because I can only handle one at a time. <laughs> Mister, you are so handsome. Here's your sister. Got your parents, got your sister there. Oh, we got it. Okay. We're taking a risk here. We're taking a risk. Oh, look at the tie. Oh, church, I hope you can see how cute these little two ones are. He's so heavy. He's so heavy. Yeah. yeah. He bring all the milk in. Does he eat a lot? Does he eat, neat, neat, neat? Yeah. He's so heavy, and the beast is not heavy. He's little. 
Pastor Karen's going to say a word of blessing over this family this morning. Join me in prayer. Lord, you have been so good to us. Your hands have never ceased to provide. We thank you today for this family, yes, Jermaine, yes, Kessia. Lord. Yes, Lord. For their children, Lord, that Lord, you have Lord, blessed them bless with. Them Lord, I pray that your hand will continue to be upon their lives, that you will continue to provide, that you will supply all their needs in according yes. to your riches mm -hmm. in glory. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that you will grant them wisdom and patience and vision to grow these children in the way that you would be pleased, Lord, so that when they are older, they will not depart from your word. I pray that they will teach them how to love you, how to, to respect your word, how to depend on you, Lord, for everything that they need. Lord, bind them together with one cord as a family. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that sickness will not come near them, Lord, that they will trust you for everything that they need for these children. Lord, bless them. Bless them, Lord, as only you can in Jesus name amen. 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 amen thank you so much for the privilege of dedicating these children God bless you church thanks for being with us this morning